Hello, listeners. Today, I am thrilled to introduce my next guest who truly embodies the essence of dynamic storytelling in Australian media. From securing an AFI Outstanding Young Film Critics Award during his high school years to donning the hat of film critic, a quiz master and everything in between, his journey has been nothing short of remarkable. But today, we're diving deep into his latest masterpiece, The Mission, and exploring the intricate tapestry of storytelling that forms the backdrop of his illustrious career. Ladies and gentlemen, buckle up as we embark on this fascinating journey with none other than one of Australia's most esteemed journalists and documentary producers, Mr. Mark Fennell. Thank you so much for joining me on the Staying Alive and Rich podcast. Um, I'm so excited to have you uh, on the show today. But um, I'm really looking forward to talking about your new project, The Mission. Um, oh, thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. But I'm going to start off with um, just for those that haven't seen your work, um, asked, I just want to know a little bit more about your career and how you became, because you, you've got such an array and varied projects that you've worked on in the past. Um, you've And you've, you've also interviewed um, celebrities and, um, and you've been a host um, and all sorts of things. So how did you get into um, journalism, first of all? And then how did that translate into documentary making <laughs> as well? Like, it's, it's, it's all epic. accidental. It's, it's all, all accidental. Yes. It's, um, I, when I was in high school, I had this grand plan. I was going to be a graphic designer by day and I was going to be a filmmaker by night. Don't ask me why it had a, like, day-night separation. It just did. That's the world's most mediocre superhero. Um, <laughs> and I think uh, what actually happened was when I was very young, I uh, I fell into doing community radio and they taught me how to do radio. And actually the thing I started off based, and I think what a lot of people probably to some degree in a certain generation still know me as, as a film critic, I was the, the movie reviewer for- The, the uh, movie um, man. That ma- that's right for for Triple J and for a bunch of people. I did that for a long time, and actually, um, it was only I didn't really have a career plan beyond that. To be <laughs> honest with you, I was like, I just want to be the film critic for Triple J. Uh, and then after that, I I think I just I got in the habit of chucking a lot of stuff at the wall and seeing what stuck. And one of the things that happened was I I ended up working on a television show called Hungry Beast, where I, it was probably one of the first times I felt. I was asked to make things about stuff that weren't movies. Mm -hmm. So I would make stories on technology and media and culture. And eventually um, a big chunk of the team that did Hungry Beast went on to make another show for SBS called The Feed, which was like a nightly news program uh, that I did for about nine years. And something really interesting happened on that show where because I'd done movies, I started interviewing movie stars. And I spent a good, you know, eight or nine years just travelling around the world interviewing the likes of, you know, Will Smith and Jennifer Lawrence, and I, I liked, you know, normally these movie stars do these sort of junkets where they mm-hmm. kind of sit and you and you've you've seen it if uh, whenever you see these movie stars sit and they've got the poster of the movie behind them and uh, and all these people come in from like the morning shows and they ask some questions like what drew you to this role, and I found myself on that circuit and I found. I wanted a challenge with that where you've only usually got you know five to fifteen minutes with these people. So what can I, what kind of conversations can I have with these people that are going to be genuinely illuminating for the audience mm. and genuinely interesting for me and also interesting for them? Because whenever there's a conversation happening, uh, be it you know a podcast or television show, there's always at least three people in the conversation. There's you, there's me, and then there's the audience. That's right. Yeah. And so, and so I sort of set this goal of like, can I get something interesting out of it? And those interviews started doing really well. Like they, they like people, you know, millions of people would watch them on Facebook and things like that. And so uh, that eventually segued into doing kind of interviews with all kinds of people with amazing life stories for the feed. Uh, and eventually that kind of grew into documentaries. And now the feed it no longer exists as a, as a television program anymore. But we have off the back of it, we set up a team of people just to make these bingeable documentaries mm-hmm. um, for, for SBS because we made one a couple of years ago about uh, a theft of, of, of a Picasso painting uh, in Melbourne. And it just did really well. <laughs> we were like, oh, maybe quite like this stuff so well, it's intriguing uh, and it's yeah. mystery and you and it's in your and i mean if you're in australia it's like that happens here really you only hear it you yeah. don't see this sort of stuff on on movies and it happens overseas not here i think that's a big part of it right i think a lot of the stories that i do 
certainly for the for the SBS documentary team, there's sort of stories that had they happened anywhere else, mm. they would already be on Netflix and Amazon and things like that. And I feel like we have incredible stories in this country um, that do deserve, you know, super bingeable, talkable documentaries. Um, but we, we do need to kind of uh, make them. <laughs> and we, luckily we have a little team that's capable of doing that reasonably fast. Um, and I do a lot of the other work I do is overseas. So I do a show for the ABC called Stuff the British Stole, which is about stolen mm. artifacts. And that I've basically spent a quarter of the year on the road filming that. And but every once in a while, it is nice to kind of go, you know, we actually genuinely have incredible, incredible yarns in Australia and and, uh, and they're remarkable and they're entertaining and they're dark and they do need to be told. And I love that we do get to I have a job where I can actually do that. Yeah, yeah, no, and you do it so well, if I can say oh, that. You, stop it. No, You're being you too do. Kind. <laughs> I'm not. I'm seriously, you do it really well. You do it really well. So I, mean, I know you, you touched on the people that you interviewed, some of the high-profile people that did interview. I personally love the interview that you did with the late Michael Parkinson. I thought it was fantastic. Oh, I love Parky. Yeah, love no, it was such a beautiful interview and such a great insight on how he got into journalism too, how his dad took him under in the mine and, and he was like, yeah, not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was really Really, 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 um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. But for you, out of all the people that you've interviewed, can you tell me what um, what makes a great interview and are there any moments for you that took you by surprise or that stand out? Oh, all the time. And, I, and, and you chase them. I like to be surprised in interviews. I think, um, look, I think all interviewing comes down to time, right? It's either time before you get in the room or time in the room. Uh, and so what I mean by that is when you're interviewing anybody, if you have enough, if you have enough innate curiosity and enough time in front of them, eventually something interesting will happen and then you can edit out all the boring bits, right? <laughs> but in the case, but in the case of most celebrities in particular, but anybody in the public eye, really, you don't usually have the benefit of time in the room. And mm -hmm. so what that means is the time component shifts beforehand. So I would, before I'd interviewed anybody famous, I would just spend hours on YouTube uh, watching old interviews with them. I particularly like finding old radio interviews with people because often mm -hmm. they, they aren't transcript, transcribed and they're harder to find and the information from them doesn't end up in Wikipedia pages. So I, I liked kind of digging around for people. And what you're looking for is a sweet spot of stuff where you know they're comfortable talking about it but the story isn't complete, mm -hmm. right? So you're looking for, oh, they said something about this but I've got other questions about that and I think I can ask questions that kind of push it forward, right? Um, but you also want to get a gaze on like, oh, they seem really uncomfortable talking about that. Don't go there. Mm. And you know that not so that you can necessarily like, you know, like ignore the stuff they're uncomfortable with, but it means like if there's something you think is interesting within that, you know to think more carefully about how to broach that idea, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, you don't, I don't always get the, I didn't always get the, the target right, but I do think that uh, that if you don't have time in the room, you need the time beforehand yeah. to know to get to, to know, know yeah. what's to, what to get best out of them, and that was really important for me. And I think ultimately the goal, whenever I did any of these interviews, I had like very specific. You want at least three moments that mm. felt thoroughly authentic and were interesting, and no other two combination of people could have produced that moment. So, because when you're doing an interview with anybody, you and I right now, this mm. is a totally unique moment mm. that only you and I can have. Mm -hmm. um, and what is it that this combination of personalities can combine to create something that's genuinely interesting that you won't hear anyone else, mm. anywhere else? That was the goal. Didn't always, like I said, didn't always succeed, but at least three moments like that per episode, uh, per, per interview, always felt like this will work. Yeah. This, this will track, this, this, this will feel like an... Um, the audience will go, oh, yeah, that was really worthwhile. So I yeah. often, I would always put those kinds of rules on things. That's great. But you can, you, you do, you, when when I was watching some of your interviews, you really do, you do get those moments, a lot of them, I might add. I mean, Michael Parkinson was one of my favourites, and I did watch the one with Jodie Foster as well, and that was quite cool too. Mm. But um, It's interesting. I've recently started posting a bunch of them on TikTok. Yeah. Just to see how people react. Because obviously, like, <laughs> I'm an aging millennial. I don't have time to make TikToks. Um, but... <laughs> 
I'm so old, Marie. No, no, don't. If you think you're old, I'm ancient. This dinosaur here. I, I thank God I have a young crew that like <laughs> constantly, constantly fix up my trash. It's like, no, you can't do that. No, no, that, that we're not posting that. I'm like, okay, why? <laughs> constantly fix up my trash is a great name for something. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> you your, need next to docu- write. <laughs> that's your next documentary. Yeah, like a podcast or a book or something. <laughs> constantly cleaning up my trash. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So like as a as just an experiment recently I just started posting like two three minute clips from interviews I've done over the years and it's wild to me that TikTok doesn't care if they're old no. <laughs> TikTok doesn't does not care it's like oh con- interesting oh content and it just you know hundreds of thousands of views and I'm like oh okay so there's still life in this thing who knew yeah yeah no that's great that's great but we're here to talk about your net your new project which hasn't aired just yet and um I was uh reading some of the press that was sent to me and I am I can't wait for this to come out. <laughs> I've got the whole family involved. This is an amazing story, the mission. Um, mm. Now, before we get into it, like how how did this story even land on your lap? Like how did you like? Well, <laughs> funny one. Um, we I mentioned earlier, we made a film a couple of years ago um, called Framed, which is about the theft of a Picasso yep. from the um, the National Gallery of Victoria. And in the course of that, the, the writer and director, Corin Grant, who I work with quite closely, he spoke to an expert. And the expert said, oh, yeah, the thing that happened in Victoria was weird. But wait till you hear about the thing that happened in WA. Okay. And Corin's like, well, what are you talking about? Oh, well, and then s- slowly it starts tumbling out. It's like there's there's a 200, you know, there's a, there's a centuries-old monastery built by exiled Spanish monks sitting in the middle of the West Australian bushland. I'm like, firstly, that alone, I'm just like, sorry, there's a what now in the warehouse? And he's like, and then in the mid-80s, two crims flew over and stole what was thought to be millions of dollars worth of art. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's weird. And then, of course, the next part is like, where did they where did they want to take it to and who were they trying to sell it to? And that's where things get really strange. And so I'll tell you the thing about, I, I make lots of podcasts and documentaries about strange crimes, right? It's a mm. weird habit I've gotten into the last couple of years. <laughs> and typically what happens is you start with a really intriguing opening gambit, like a really mm. intriguing opening idea. And then as you start scratching the surface and as you start talking to people, it all starts to become a bit more normal, right, generally speaking. So you interview somebody and like, oh, yeah, that's why they stole that. Oh, that's why they did that. It all starts to become a bit same, same. This was the exact opposite. It started weird. And then it just got weirder. Really? <laughs> it got weirder and weirder and weirder. And eventually what you find is this place where this went down, this this monastery. Yeah, because it's like a tiny little town. What is it, New, New York, Nunorca? Is yeah, that how you spell it? Nunorcia. Nunorcia. Yeah. And it was and like it, the Benedictine, is that is that the one? Yeah, Benedictine monks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but the thing is it has layers of crimes, essentially, that take place there. And some of the crimes right, like, are downright comedic, like they're farcical. Mm-hmm. And then as you start going through the layers of them, some of the crimes that actually went down in New Norcia are evil, oh, just wow. horrific, right? So wow. I, at a certain point, I, I sort of started saying to the team, I thought that, you know, it should just be called the many crimes at New Norcia, but it doesn't really sound very catchy. So I think what you've what is unusual about this story is that it starts with this very unusual crime, and then the tendrils of that crime, they reach out all around the world. And before I knew it, I was standing outside the Trump building in New York or talking to, you know, uh, artists in the middle of a warehouse in London or all the way to, you know, the the streets of Manila and the Philippines. And it was one of these things where it started really, like, odd. And then before I knew it, the, the, the kind of the threads of the story reached right around the world. And that was, and it was bizarre. Every, every stage of it was bizarre. And it just got stranger and stranger. And the real challenge was how do you guide an audience through the down mm. these very unusual pathways? It sounds it sounds fascinating, but also um, a bit cryptic as well. You know, for you, you know, trying to kind of piece it all together. You know, you you just said you you went from this tiny little town, and what is a Spanish monastery doing in this tiny little town in Western Australia? Um, mm. Uh, and then end up all over the world trying to piece it all together. Yeah, well, one thing to say, uh, these things aren't made 
solo, so we've got a little team. <laughs> so it's not just me. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and, but in my mind, it's just you. I'm just like thinking yeah. of you jumping on a plane, going to the. me. Room. What I'm am doing I doing here? <laughs> no, we have a we have a little team, and uh, we've made a lot of television together over the years, and so we work quite closely together. And Corin Corin Grant, who did Framed and did this one, he's he really drove this one, and he he's from WA, he lives in WA, which really helped, I think, um, uh, kind of piece it together. And I think, you know. We knew it was interesting. Um, what we didn't, when we sort of committed to making it, what we didn't realise at the time was how far it would go, how far it would reach, and and, and what it would kind of reveal mm. about uh, about the the place itself, but also about you know, in a weird kind of way, it kind of opens up a really dark chapter in Australia's history as well, mm. as to why the the monastery was built in the first place. So, I you can tell I'm being intentionally cryptic. I like. I know. I know. I'm way. sitting there going, "Oh, can you just tell me a little bit more?" But I know you don't want to give away too much because the documentary is coming out. But maybe I we like can mysteries. dance. Maybe we can <laughs> dance around it a little bit. Um, you know what was. Can you give me like a, a hint of what was something really unexpected that you discovered during this? Well, the place where they were trying, it seems they were trying to sell the paintings to. Mm-hmm. So once they stole the paintings, talk about you know more than a dozen paintings here, right? And they're beautiful. They're breathtakingly beautiful paintings. Are they? Fa- are they? Pa- uh, famous pa- uh, painters, pa- like paintings. Yes, yeah, they are really. They, they are. I mean, in the in the realm of, of painting world, we're talking about old. What well, they they refer to as old masters paintings, so oh, a certain okay. era, and they're beautiful. They like the way the they capture light is breathtaking. Mm-hmm. But the idea was that they would sell it to a. How do I put this, a very powerful family in Southeast Asia who okay. exerted an enormous amount of control over the land that they ruled and. When that idea came up that that that's where the paintings were, somewhere along the line, someone had an idea to give the painting, to sell the paintings to them. When that idea came up, I was like, that's so far-fetched. That's ridiculous. And then we got to this country mm-hmm. and we started asking people, and I expected people to be like, no, that's ridiculous. And then something odd happened where, where all the people we spoke to in this particular Asian country, they, they sort of turned their head and were like, I mean... It's plausible. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> really? I think in some of these shots you can kind of see my face going, I thought this was a wild goose chase, but you're telling me now that some of this stuff is plausible. So I think one of the, I mean, it, it, it has been said before, but truth is, in fact, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes genuinely stranger than fiction. And that's what this this film sort of taught me. You know, I remember like standing in, in um Outside, a, um, I mentioned the Trump building, which mm. connects to the the family who were one of the targets, we think, of the theft. Um, we, I remember just standing there going, this is so wild that this, some, you know, th- that I've ended up here, given where this story starts and sort of this, you know, tracks of wheat in, in Western Australia. Um, so I, I think sometimes in this job you do have these, like, slight out-of-body moments where you just look around and go, is this actually happening? Get here. <laughs> yeah, how did this happen? And it seems to happen to me an awful lot these days. You're meant to you're meant to do it. You're obviously, you know, you do a good job at investigating and getting down to the nitty-gritty of it all. But can I ask like looking at the trailer and kind of reading some of the press, like I said, we're not going to give away too much. We are going to kind of dance around it because I want the viewers to go and watch this because I can't wait for it. I can't wait. I, I don't think I've ever anticipated a documentary as much as this one, <laughs> honestly. Um, Take that, Beckham. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But what I found um, even, well, comical is that the guys that stole these were amateurs. It wasn't a sophisticated operation. No, and I think the that was as much a surprise for the cops as, as it was for anybody because I think they expected to find these really uh, skilled, smooth Ocean's Eleven style. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, and and I uh, sort of crims and actually that's the exact opposite of what these guys were. Um, and I, it's interesting to I haven't covered a bit of art crime in the past. The consistent thing I get, I've realised that it's 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 really not. It's almost never that smooth Ocean's Eleven style thing that you like to imagine that it is. It's usually pretty chaotic and usually there's essential pieces of the plan that are missing, let's say. 
<laughs> and so I think that it was a real interesting reality check on how art heists seem to actually happen. Wow. Wow. When you say piece of the, it's it's chaotic, can you kind of share a little well, bit? Well, I mean, a good example is um, the getaway car. Okay. Right? So these these guys, they rented a car. They, they, they rented a car and they stayed in the area under their own names, which mm-hmm. is not, you know, <laughs> not <Ideal>. great, you <laughs> know, crime craft right there. But the car that they, you know, like mostly when, when you rent a car, right, they're usually pretty boring looking. Mm. These guys rented a gold, <laughs> brand new <laughs> Ford Falcon. You imagine that screaming down the highways in 1986. Wow. Everyone remembered the car. Everyone remembered the car. <laughs> and there and like everyone's like, oh yeah, there was a gold Ford Falcon. So they, you know, little things like uh, and the car itself, the boot, wasn't big enough for the paintings. So they ended up actually damaging the paintings, <gasps> trying to get it all to fit. So there's uh you see what I mean with like oh there's a lot of God. there was a lot of decisions that in retrospect weren't great, you know? They just weren't great. Did they re- did did well, I mind mean, this might spoil it. I don't want to actually. I was going to say, do they recover the paintings? But you know, maybe my. You do might. you know what? This one I'll give you. This All right, one I'll go, give go, you. go. They did recover the paintings. Oh, that's a win. That's good. Yes, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Especially you know, you know, paintings like that that are, would probably be worth millions, mm. given when they were painting. It sounds like they were um, Renaissance, maybe what 14th, 15th century. I'm guessing, um, yeah. and they would be worth a over million. over a long period. It's, it's, yeah. it's quite a disparate collection of stuff. Wow. Wow. Incredible. In- mm. Absolutely incredible. Um, what do you, what do you want the viewers to take from this in terms of after, like, what do you, you've, you've created this documentary. What do you want the viewers to take from the, what? what Come for the ride. You? Come for the ride. <laughs> like, it was a roller coaster to make and it's a roller coaster to watch. Come for the ride. That's my, that's my, that's my, my go-to on this one. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not, here to lecture people about the history of art or crime or anything like that. I'm just like, come for the ride, let it, let it, the insanity of some of it just hit you. But then it, la- I will like, but fair warning, it lands you in a pretty, um, in a place that seems really unexpected. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, my number one thing for people is just come for the ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's certainly going to be a ride, that's for sure. After this um, chat with you, I'm even more. I'm looking forward to it even more. What? Oh, a, thank you. What? Um, had I guess from a from a documentary making point of view, like, and you know, you, you're piecing all these things together. And I'm going to go back to this again. I know I asked you this earlier, but yeah. I am actually fascinated with how you come, at, how you pull all these different uh, pieces of the puzzle to create this story. What's your process in that? Well, um, the team, I mean, Corin had a very clear idea about what he wanted this to be pretty much from the outset, uh, from the outset. But one of the things that happens with documentary making as opposed to drama is that you, you can only build a story out of what people are willing to tell you or what you found evidence of or transcripts mm. of or things like that. So you are, you know, you, you have this. You have to have an allegiance to the truth mm-hmm. that stands paramount, but also you can only build a story and take an audience on a ride out of what already exists mm. to some degree, or, or what or what a person can tell you on camera. And that creates all kinds of interesting challenges. Where, you know, like if say uh, a person doesn't want to go on camera, but they do tell you some information, you have this question of how do you bring it to life? And one of the decisions we made with this series was that. Um, because we had all these transcripts from the police interrogations and from the courts um, that, you know, Corin did an incredible job kind of hanging, you know, t- talking to people at courts and getting a hold of, and some of this stuff has never, never been publicised before, never been kind of, you know, been out there for people to properly kind of see. Once we got it, I remember he, you know, had this big binder of all these, you know, evidence and um uh, and, and court transcripts and, and stuff. And I, and I remember reading it and we both sort of had the same thought, which is like, it sounds like dialogue. Mm. It sounds like you want to be in the room. Mm. So we made a decision that we were, it's, um, we were going to get actors mm-hmm. and kind of bring that to life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it is a bit of a docudrama in that sense mm. in that it's, it's very much a documentary, but there's all of this action that's been done with actors, you know, essentially lifted from what was said in these rooms. 
And I think that was a really crucial point of go- of kind of making it feel real mm. for people. And mm. it meant we could recreate the 80s and, and all this kind of stuff. So I think um, you have a set, I guess, collection of tools available to you to bring the past to life. And we decided that actors was probably the best way of doing it. And in terms of structure and how you pull these things together, I, you know, there's a few basic rules, which is never tell people anything before they absolutely need to know it. Sometimes mm-hmm. when you make this as the documentaries, they sort of front load the beginning with all the context, but actually it's better to gradually reveal mm-hmm. bits and pieces of history only when you need to know it, only when it's relevant to the story mm-hmm. that's unfolding in front of you. But um, no, I mean, it's Corin really kind of, um, he's the writer and director. He kind of really guided and really understood what he wanted to make. But there's when any time you make a documentary, that it always throws you curveballs. Um, you can't script reality. What was you one of the curveballs? Kind of... Can you share one of the curveballs? Uh, I'll say that there is one one person involved in the theft who is still alive who didn't want to go on camera, so we had to find a creative way of depicting them. Ah, uh, okay. Mm. Was was this was this heist actually um, publicised in the eighties? Yeah, actually, it was, but what happened, it was quite big news briefly. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, do you remember Azaria Chamberlain? Yeah, the, yeah, My yeah. dingo got my baby. Yeah. Uh, the There was a crucial piece of evidence about that crime that came out shortly after this crime unfolded, and uh, a lot of the major turning points were sort of buried because of the, uh-huh. cha- the yeah, Zara Chamber- Chamberlain case because that just took up so much news and so much yeah, attention. Yeah. So it is a fairly, I would argue it's a pretty forgotten chapter in okay. Australian history. Um, there are, and it, even just going around talking to people who were there, mm. just the, even their recollection is like, God, what did happen? So it, it is just one of these weird th- bits of Australian history that I think has, I would say, bit, I don't think it's been lost, but I think if it isn't recorded and, and things like this aren't made, it may well become forgotten. Mm, mm. 100%, 100%. Mm. Oh, well, you know what? I Like I said, it's there's so many elements of the, of, of this, the mission that uh, are, are interesting to me as an, as an individual. I'm very intrigued by the whole thing. I love, I do love art and, um, and I'm still blown away how there's this monastery in the middle of this tiny little town that hold, mm. held these amazing artworks. So I can't wait to see how the story unfolds. I just want to say um, thank you for sharing that information with me today. Um, we uh, we can't wait to kind of put it up on our website and um, and have it looked at. But before you go, I do mm. want to ask a few questions about any budding journalists out there. And you've answered most of them, to be fair. You've given some great little um, gems of advice here for young um, journalists that, you know, want to embark on on a career such as yours. Um, and you've had um, – so your your mother, I think I was reading, was a teacher and your dad was a photographer. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I want to know whether they influenced you a little bit because I know you're half Indian. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, he's not a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> no, no, there's there's very few doctors and lawyers. My, uh, my side, uh, certainly the Indian side, anyway. Yeah. Um, there's one or two lawyers. Uh, my did my parents influence? You know what? Because your dad was yes. a photographer, so um, that's kind yeah. of media. Yeah, I mean, I as a kid, I used to hang around dad's studios Mm -hmm. and like i used to just i so i kind of got comfortable around cameras i guess Mm -hmm. um i actually think what's more important less about their careers is like they used to tape everything off tv for me so i could watch it (laughs) so like yeah yeah so like i'd I'd get dad would tape all this stuff that i wanted to watch and i'd you know i'd come home from school the next day and just watch all these you know movies and tv shows or like and just like absorb Yeah, yeah um so i think that was probably really important and and i think you know, as as with all kind of parents, I particularly parents who you know they they I think they're the first of their generation. They're the first generation of both of their families to um to get into university and things like that. You know, it's so like very sort of like 
It's a big deal. First, second generation yeah. Australian sort of thing where you're like, you know, the, your parents are immigrants and they work there and the kids work their asses off to get sort of stable careers and mm. stuff like that. And then the next generation after that, which is me, which is like, mm, I might go work in arts. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think there was always a bit of like, can't you just go work in IT or be a teacher initially? Yeah. Um, and because I come from a long line of teachers on mum's side. Oh, wow. Uh, or, or, or like, well, as in not a long line, but like as in a lot of my uncles and cousins. Um, un- uncles and aunts were, were teachers. Well, document- good, reliable. Well, yeah, you know. Well, your documentaries are kind of like teaching people, though. It's a, Thank you. A, I'm going to stick with it. If it ever comes up again, that's going to be my excuse. I'm going to stick with it. There's a current of teaching in there, you know. I think so, but I I also think pretty quickly my parents worked out like I, I work pretty hard, and I was probably and I chuck a lot of stuff at the wall to see what's going to stick, and and I don't like. Uh, I don't like not being busy, you mm. know, so I really like working on multiple things at once because you never know. Like, it's media careers. You never know when it's all just going to fall apart, right? So you, you just try a lot of things and you see what works and if a lot of things often don't work, but nobody notices, nobody outside of me knows that. Mm. So um, what people see is what comes out. You know, they see the things that did get over the line. Mm. So I, I think it's important, I mean, if you to come back to your earlier point about Mm, um, advice for younger people getting into the industry. It's like, don't don't just do one thing. Mm. Like, the people that just do one thing are the easiest people to fire, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, they do one job. Yeah. The people that thrive in any kind of media arts, the people that do more than one, mm. that can do editing and grading or like they can do sound and they can like those are the people that su- succeed yeah the people that are considered valuable so i would and also you don't you don't know what you're actually going to end up making right so agree particularly when you're young like you may my wife was going to start she's a journalist she works mm-hmm. in broadcasting but her plan was to work in newspapers you know when she mm. was a kid you know she's started 34j gazette and in, in, in school right but now she works in in radio and podcasting right so you don't know what the future actually holds so just try a lot of things try different mediums try mm. television try podcasting try magazines try news just see what happens because mm. you don't know you also don't know what's going to happen with the industry you know like right. this, think about this like this conversation us being remote with broadcast quality microphones in front of us. That didn't exist five years ago. The fact no. that we could do it over the internet didn't really exist properly uh, and, until, you know, just a kind of handful of years ago. So I think just a recognition that if you try lots of different things and you're constantly trying different things, you will be better prepared for an ever-changing media environment. And we know the way people are consuming is in constant flux. Mm, so mm. I think just... Being really ambidextrous, for lack of a better term, yeah. with your your skill sets is probably the most c- career securing thing you can do. Yeah, I think that's really good. that's great advice. You're 100 percent right. See, Peter, this is why I do everything. <laughs> <laughs> My I can see Peter. I can see Peter's smile in the yeah, reflection. Yeah, he's, he's like, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's like, I don't know what we're doing anymore. One minute we're doing podcasts, then we're writing articles, then we're doing this. Then we're doing that. I go, it's part of media. Just do it. <laughs> no, you it's never good. know what's going to take off. It's so so true. Um, but I also have to ask you one more question. Mm. I've got to ask you about out of all the things that you've done. All right, and this was on your website, hence why I'm asking. What's with the hand modelling gig? <laughs> I need to see your hands. Show me those hands. <laughs> They're not very special now. Okay. But my dad was a photographer, I mentioned uh. earlier. <laughs> In the 90s, my dad had to do a photo shoot for rent kill who are the people that make, amongst other things, toilets. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, the female hand model did not turn up. Oh, nice. And so Dad, in a fantastic act of uh, of ingenuity, thought to himself, what passes as a female hand model's <laughs> hand? And he looked at 10-year-old, my 10-year-old, it would have been 10 or 11-year-old hands, and he goes, oh, yeah, that could pass. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> there's a somewhere in the, um, in probably sitting in the the back catalogues of some hardware store is you know a picture of a toilet bowl with with a hand holding a piece of you know a napkin just kind of like gently that's cleaning it. That's my hand. <laughs> <laughs> they happened. I, it happened a few times. Like I think there was a child model that pulled out of a 
of a, I think it, I think in the end it was a billboard for a shopping center, and I just got like deputized, be like, pop your head over, and somewhere there's a oh, picture of me, uh, I think for Birkenhead Point in Sydney. Anyway, I, I put it there because I think it's silly, and it does kind of speak to. Do you know what's funny about it? Because it that stuff happens all the time. In photo shoots, in film shoots, where you have to, something doesn't go right and you just have to improvise with the people there. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, I've always liked it because I think it's funny. I, I can't, I, what I should do is is get Dad to find a copy of the photo. And stick it, stick it on the website. So we stick can it on see. the website. Yeah, I'm telling you. Because, like, after I read that, I'm like, oh, I want to know now. <laughs> Yeah, that's the story. That's it was, a good uh, story. That's a good yeah. story. Dad's resourceful. I like Dad. That's really good. He but, is very resourceful, that's for sure. So we're going to tune into SBS for the three-part series. It's set to premiere at 8.30 p.m. Tuesday, the 24th of October, and new episodes will air weekly for The Mission. So, Hot tip, though, we're going to drop all three episodes at once on SBS On Demand. So if you like what you see, you can binge the whole thing in one go. Oh, that's me. <laughs> that's totally me. That's 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 a that's a good night in, I reckon. And some chocolate. Um happy days. Happy days. Um, Excellent. Mark, thank you so much again um for joining me today and for your time as well. I really appreciate it. I'm really looking forward to watching the documentary and I'm also looking forward to what's hap- what's next for you as well. So awesome. um, thank I you. can't wait to see what you've got in the pipeline for 2024. So that's going to be exciting. Come and talk to me again. <laughs> Will do. All kinds of fun stuff, I promise. Oh, good, good. As long as there's a bit of curi- curiosity and mystery to it, we're all there. We're all there. Tons. Tons and tons. Thank it's you. lovely talking to you.